Hey everyone, how's it going? Dave here from DaveMarrowPhotography.com. Welcome back to my three-part series on planning for Milky Way, Night Sky, and Star Photography. This is part two of my three-part series, so if you didn't catch part one yet, click the link on the screen and check that out first, then head back to part two. In today's session, I'm going to show you how I use Google Earth and the Photographer's Ephemeris to plan for my shoots. I'll often use Google Earth to plan for shots within mountainous regions like the one you see on the screen right now. When you're looking at a region like this, it's really hard to decide which vantage points will actually give you clear views of mountains or certain peaks in the area. By using Google Earth, you can see from above, allowing you to easily plan for shots like this. I use Google Earth to plan for this shot, and I'll show you exactly how in this following tutorial. Next, we're going to jump into the photographer's ephemeris, where I'll show you how to plan for sunrise and sunset, and also moonrise and moonset, including twilights. Looking at the photo on the screen right now, you can see that there's a soft glow coming out of the right-hand side of the photo. This is from the moonlight. I planned this shot so the moon was just coming up over the horizon and adding a really nice glow to the whole scene. Using moonlight, you can cut down on your ISO and keep a lot of noise out of your night images and also provide some really nice color and light. Here's another shot that can be planned using the photographer's ephemeris. This was taken at Mountain Hood in Oregon. If you look at the left hand side of the picture, you can see there's a soft faint glow coming in and also lighting up the mountain. This was also shot under moonlight. Using the photographer's ephemeris, I was able to plan moonset and see when the moonlight would come across, light up the landscape and Mount Hood, as well as White River in front of it. I'm going to go ahead and open Google Earth and we're going to dive right in and get started with this tutorial. So what you're looking at is the Earth as seen from Google Earth, zoomed way out. I always start out here and we can start to zoom in. What I wanted to show you is that you can actually see the Milky Way in these photos. And using Google Earth, you can see where the Milky Way is. I just find Stellarium to be a lot better for actually planning where the Milky Way will be and seeing what stars will be in which locations. And I'll show you that in part three of this video series. So let's just go ahead and zoom in. I'm going to zoom into Mount Rainier since that's the photo we talked about in the little opening to this video tutorial. I'll just go over here to Washington. There's Seattle and here's Mount Rainier right here in the middle of the Cascade Range. So just take your pointer and you can zoom all the way in. And if you don't have Google Earth, I'll leave a little link below this video where you can download it. It's a free application you can go ahead and use. So within Google Earth, the first thing I like to do is just get orientated where I'll be. And it's always just good to kind of zoom out and you kind of want to look at these landscapes. And you can kind of get an idea of where good vantage points might be by just looking over the landscapes and seeing what higher elevations might lead you to a good shot. So if you want Mount Rainier in your shot and you want it to be during sunrise or sunset, Sunset would be over here to the west, while sunrise would be back here to the east. So you could plan the light and see what it's going to look like on the mountain ranges. Another easy way to do that is to use this button right here, which will actually show the light across the landscapes. And you can actually drag these sliders to see, see where that light will be at certain times of the day. And it's not exact, but it does a pretty good job at showing you which will be lit up and what won't be lit up. And you can turn that on and toggle it on and off at any time you like. And that also works at night. It'll show you where the Milky Way will be, but it's just not as accurate as something like Stellarium. So I tend to use Stellarium to plan for my Milky Way shots. But for a shot like Mount Rainier, or a location like Mount Rainier, you can kind of just zoom out. And you want to get at a level that you can see these different peaks all through here, and you can see which ones might be higher and lead to a better vantage point of the mountain. So when I was looking for that shot, I was kind of looking at a nice vantage point, and I wanted the mountain to be right up in my face. So I knew that somewhere in here where there was no peaks blocking the front of the mountain would be a great place to shoot from. So I could shoot from anywhere in this region right here along this ridge line or down in this area somewhere. You could also shoot from up here but you might be a little bit further back from the mountain so it wouldn't be right up in your face. So you can turn on the pictures and often when I'm scouting for new locations that I haven't been to before I'll just click through these different pictures and I'm not looking for great landscape photos. I'm just looking for pictures that might lead me to a little bit more information about the area, what the landscapes might be like, if there's trees, if there's a barrenness region that I could actually get an open shot from. Because a lot of times when you're hiking in the backcountry, you'll find that you might see a peak like this on a topographic map, but when you get to the top of the peak, you'll realize it's all covered in trees, so you don't really have an open shot of a mountain anyway. So using photos like this on Google Earth, people have already been there, and they'll probably tag the photos with a little geotag, and it'll show you if they've gotten good open shots of the mountain. So like right here, you can see that there are open shots of the mountain. Now you can go over here and see what it looks like as well. And it's hit or miss. I mean, sometimes you might get a photo that shows a great view of that area. Sometimes it'll be a photo of a flower, which doesn't really help you out with the landscape. But it can give you a good idea after doing some research. And if you're from the area, this doesn't help so much because you might know where you're going. But if you're going somewhere for the first time, this helps an extreme amount. 
So we'll just go in here to the area where I took that shot from. And once you get really close, you can just go up on this ridge line and turn your view around and you can actually see almost what you would see in the photo. And Google Earth does a really good job at this. So I'll just pull it in right here. And that would be about what I'd saw in that picture. And if we zoom back out here on Mount Rainier, which can be seen right here in the middle, I'm actually going to run this time clock and show you how it works. So let's so just run through the day and you can kind of see where the sun would set on a given time and day and how the mountain would be lit up by the sunset. And then you'll go into the early night and it'll get dark and then it'll get later and you can kind of see the Milky Way right here start to come through the photo. And that's just the cluster of the Milky Way. And then as the night moves on, it's getting towards the early morning and you can see the other side of the Milky Way come through right there. That's at 7.49 a.m. so it's going to be pretty light so if you're actually out taking pictures you couldn't get a shot like this of the Milky Way and we'll plan that later using Stellarium. So those are just a few cool things that you can use Google Earth for but mostly just for planning your shoots and what vantage points you want to shoot from and what elevations those vantage points come at. So check that out and see what you can do with that. Let's dive into Photographer's Ephemeris and we'll start working in there. So I've gone ahead and opened up the Photographer's Ephemeris. When you open it up, it might start at any random location. So you can go ahead up here to the search bar, and I just typed in Mount Rainier National Park, Washington, because that's where I want to plan from. And it'll drop you right down in the middle of wherever that's pointed on Google Maps. So the first thing I like to do when I'm searching for my location, I like to get this uh, bottom area all cleaned up so I don't have to look at it while I'm searching. So you can click this button right here to make it full screen, and then click this guy, and that'll take all that bottom uh, information out. We'll use that information later, but we don't need it while we're finding our location. So I'm going to zoom out here, and I'm going to drop this pin right down where I want to search from. And I was planning on this side of the park for that second shot we looked at earlier of the moon glow on the side of Mount Rainier. So we'll come in here and drop this planner right down on Reflection Lakes where that was shot from. And that's right in there. And if you want to go visit that area, it's really easy to access. You can go anytime during the summer. So I was shooting from right in this area, down in the mud somewhere, early one morning. And we're just going to do the photographer's ephemeris for Sunday, December 7th, 2014. And it looks like the moon direction was pretty close to the same as when I actually took that shot. So that should work well. So once you have your little pen drop down in the location you want to shoot from, you can go back in and you can bring these detailed areas up. So just click that again. And let's click this and it'll drop down all these menus here which will show you what's going on. Let's first let's talk about these different navigational bars right here. And we have this Astro Start. So this is the start of astronomical twilight, meaning the sun is still 18 to 12 degrees below the horizon. So if you were to take a photo, you could probably see a soft glow of the sunlight before it comes over the horizon, but your eyes really can't see the sunlight too well at this point. Uh, nautical start is 12 to 6 degrees below the horizon, so you're starting to get into the point where you can see the sunlight. Things are starting to light up. You know the day is coming. Civil start is kind of like your blue hour. Uh, you can definitely see the sun at this point. You can't actually see it over the horizon, but you can tell it's going to rise. And that means the sun will be 6 to 0 degrees below the horizon still. And then you have sunrise right here. Uh, you also, underneath these, you also have these degrees. So these are the degrees on a compass. So if you were to think due north would be 0 and 360 degrees, then east would be 90 degrees, south would be 180 degrees, west would be 270 degrees. So when you were actually planning for a trip, you could use your topographical map and your compass and you could actually plan out the exact lines of sunrise. Now since we have the internet and we can use it here, we can look at our sunrise line, which is this line right here, so you can match this line's color to the actual color right here on these drop downs. And you'll see if you measured this from north, it would be 123 degrees from north going clockwise. So north would be right here. And then 127 degrees from north going around that way would be sunrise. So that's saying that sun is at 123.2 degrees from north. Then moonset was the same thing. And for moonset, which would be this blue line right here, which shows right here as that color, Moonset would be at 297.6 degrees, so it's almost the whole way around. So if we started from due north, which would be in this area, and went the whole way around, it would be 297.6 degrees to where moon's going to set. So using a compass, that's really easy to see where your moon's going to set. 
So if you're going out on a backpacking trip, you could write all these down before your trip and when they happen on what days. And using your compass, you could easily find those degrees where the moon would set, the moon would rise, the sun would set, or the sun would rise. So if we go through the day, we'll see that at sunrise, we're going to see this little line start to pop up right here. And this little offset, smaller line, is actually where the sun's moving throughout the day. So you can see at sunrise, it comes out of this sunrise line and it starts to move across the sky. Now when it's moving across the sky, you can see the time that it's moving across the sky right here, but you can also see this plus 7.4 degrees. And that's the sun's apparent altitude. That just means how high the sun is in the sky. So it's seven degrees up and down off the horizon. So if you took a protractor and put it facing towards the sun, the sun would be up 7.4 degrees off the horizon. And you can also see that the moon right now is negative 3.3 degrees below the horizon. If you took that same protractor, pointed it directly at the moon, and turned the protractor upside down, the moon would actually be dropped 3.3 degrees below the horizon, so you would no longer be able to see it. And as we move through the day, you'll see that the sun's going up as far as these degrees go, and that the moon's going down. So the moon's down below the horizon, it's getting further and further below the horizon, and the sun's going up. Now at some point, right in here, you'll see that the sun's still going up to 20 degrees, gets a little bit higher, and obviously during the winter the sun's not going to get as high in the sky, especially in the Pacific Northwest. So it's getting a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and now you see it's starting to go down again. So that's about midday, that's about when the sun's at its highest point, is about 1230. And then you're going to see these degrees start to go back down, which means the sun's getting lower in the sky again as it's getting closer to sunset. So we can keep going through there, and eventually the sun's going to set, and when it sets, this tells us that it is at 236.5 degrees. So if we look over here at sunset, 236.7 degrees is exactly what it is. And that means from due north, if we measure around clockwise on our map, it'll be at 236.7 degrees. So we can keep going here. And you can also see where the astronomical twilight ends, the civil twilight ends, and the nautical twilight ends. Now since twilights happen in the beginning and the end of the day, they work the exactly same way, just in the opposite manner. So civil end means the sun's 0 to 6 degrees below the horizon. Nautical end means the sun is at 6 to 12 degrees below the horizon. And astro end means the sun's 12 to 18 degrees below the horizon. And you can actually see all this goes on during the graph as well. And then you have the moonrise again. So over here is the moonrise line. So we're going to see the moon come back up. And if we start right where the moonrise is, you'll see the moon's going to rise at 63.5 degrees, which means from due north the moon's going to be 63.5 degrees clockwise. And it's also going to be at plus zero degrees on the horizon. So plus zero degrees means it's just rising. And as it rises, you'll see this altitude go up. It's going further, further, and further up. And it's just getting higher and higher in the sky. And eventually it'll get to a point where it's not going to get any higher in the sky and it'll go back down. So that's a brief overview of all these different settings in the Photographer's Ephemeris. And you can use this to plan your shoots. So let's say you wanted to plan for a Milky Way shoot. As discussed in part one of this video series, you'll need to be at or near the new moon phase. So a really nice feature of building the Photographer's Ephemeris are these little right and left buttons right here. Any day you're on, if you click this right button, you'll see the next portion of the moon phase. So the next portion would be the waning crescent. Now if you keep going through these, you want to pick a night where the moon phase, as in waning crescent, says 0.0%. That means none of the moon can be seen. At this point, it means you're on the night of a new moon. So you'll see in this little drop down menu, it'll also pop up as the new moon night. So that shows that December 21st is the night of the new moon. So that being said, you can go a few days on either side of the new moon and still get some really nice shots. So if you use these days, or these clickers right here, you can go forward and back a few days. So what we want to look for here is we want to make sure that the sun has set and the moon has also set, leaving a very dark sky for us to shoot the Milky Way. So let's take a look down at these drop downs. If we go December 18th, which is a few days before the new moon, we can see that the sun sets at 1619, which is 419 p.m and also that the moon sets in the early afternoon is 1412. So that means any time after the sun sets, it's gonna be completely dark. Now the moon doesn't rise until three in the morning. So that gives us from the time of sunset or a little bit after, all the way until the time right before moonrise to shoot. 
Now it's always good to say that you should wait an hour or two after the rise or set of any celestial body before you go ahead and shoot. So it's always good to wait about two hours after sunset or two hours before moonrise. Otherwise you'll see the light from the sun and the moon in the sky and you won't get some really good shots. So on this night we could start shooting at about 1819 and we could shoot until around midnight or a little bit after even one or two o'clock and still get some really nice shots which gives us five or six hours to shoot. Now in the summer when the sun rises early and the sun sets late you'll have to plan these shoots a little bit more efficiently because the time of darkness isn't quite as long. Now I've moved our location down to Mount Hood in northern Oregon where we're going to plan for the next shoot. As you can see in this photo and as we discussed before the whole side of the mountain here and the landscape is lit up by moonlight. I'm going to show you exactly how I plan for this shoot. So we'll zoom in here to the White River of Mount Hood. If you wanted to pick a day that would be great for lighting up a certain feature in your landscape, such as a mountain or the foreground of a landscape, you'd want to pick a time when the moon set or moon rise was to the left or right of that feature that you'd like to light up. It could also be behind you, but I find when you're shooting with the moon or light behind you, it'll actually cast a shadow and it's really hard to get that out of the way. So from the shoot in the picture noted before, I wanted a night when the moon would be setting over to the left hand side, in turn lighting up the whole Mount Hood and the landscape in front of me. Now on this night when it's set, you can see that the moon set per the photographer's ephemeris was at 2106, which is after the sunset. So it means it was really dark by this time when the moon was setting, and it also means that the stars would be in the sky. So if I go a little bit before that moon set, right in this location, and you can see that my moon is after the sunset line and before the moon set line. And that means at this point around 8 o'clock it was dark, the stars were in the sky, but the moon wasn't too close to the horizon yet. And that's another thing you want to watch out for when you're scouting. You want the moon to still have a little bit of elevation in the sky, and you can check that by using these altitude degrees as we discussed before. So if the moon was at zero degrees, I wouldn't get any light from the moon because the entire landscape to the west of me would be blocking it. So I was aiming for a time when the moon was about 10 degrees in the sky, and it would cast that nice light and shadows over this entire landscape. So for me, that was around 8 o'clock on December 25th. So hopefully you guys were able to get some really good information from this quick tutorial. I find the best way to learn this stuff is to go into both of those programs and experiment and tell you really wouldn't know what's going on. In the next tutorial I'm going to bring you guys my favorite program Stellarium and show you how I use it to plan for my Milky Way shoots. Stellarium will allow you to see where the Milky Way rises, sets, and moves through the night sky for any landscape in any given location. This will allow you to really plan for your shoots and get great shots along the way. So give these tools a try that you've learned in part 1 and part 2 of this tutorial, and in part 3 I'll show you how to use my favorite program. Make sure to pick up a free copy of my ebook which is linked below this video tutorial once you're all done here. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.